Okay, hi, and welcome to the fourth lecture on compiler optimization. I'm Hugh Leather, and I am, of course, here with the internet sensation and sex god that is Pavlos Petermenos. Hi, hi Pavlos. <laughs> and uh, I'm here to introduce to you uh, the soon to be internet sensation and sex god, Volker Seeger. Hi, Volker. Hi. Hi. So, uh, you guys are here to learn about data flow analysis. Are you excited? Woohoo! Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Hugely excited. That was that was in no way sarcastic at all. This is great. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I would just like to say that I was supposed to have read these slides before we started, but of course, that would be some kind of work, and uh, I try to avoid work if at all possible, so I have not done that. All right. So, uh, in this lecture, we are going to uh, talk about data flow termination. I think we talked about data flow last time, didn't we? Bablos, is that right? Oh, it was, what, five <laughs> it was months ago? Five months ago. What? <laughs> Surely it was so good that it is written on the inside of your brain in a way that can't you can never forget. I think we did discuss some kind of data flow analysis stuff before. Yeah, now, yeah? now that you mention now it, I remember it very clearly. Yeah, yeah. It was five, five months ago talking about data flow analysis. The exposition was just beautiful, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, so we're going to finish that off today um, by talking about how we work out that data flow terminates. We're going to look at some other examples of data flow equations. Uh, we're going to look at dominance and at static single assignment form, which is all good stuff. Okay. No, the wrong button. There we go. All right. So, uh, we are going to need some definitions. So, you like definitions, right? These are things that you have to remember because some idiot, by the way, might, if you are taking my course, this is the kind of thing that a incredibly lazy lecturer might ask you to replicate in an exam, uh, just to check whether you actually turned up and have read any of the stuff on the course, right? Is that good? Neither of you to give a crap, they do, because you, neither of you <laughs> are actually going to be taking the exams, right? Okay, but so uh, you may have heard of fixed points before. Have you heard of fixed points? I did hear fixed points earlier, yeah. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, a fixed point of a function, uh, which the function has to go from the range and the domain have to be from the same set. Uh, and a fixed point is a point at which the function, when applied to that fixed point value, yields the same value. Okay, so this means that essentially you have reached a point in the space where repeated application of the function will not change what you're looking at. Well, that's what you wanted me to try for the machine learning thing, and then it didn't work out because it wasn't a fixed point. Uh, yes, probably. Uh, yes, uh, total non sequitur for everybody listening, but yes, absolutely right. I should explain that Volker is uh, a peer, or was a PhD student. He's now Dr. Volker, by the way. Oh, I should say Dr. Pat. Pavlos Petermanos, <laughs> uh, is now a doctor, uh, successfully did his PhD the other day. Uh, yes, way back then when you were working for me, then that's, yes, that's what we were talking about. Okay, so that's our first definition. The next definition is a uh, partial ordering. So this is a relation uh, between elements of some set that has reflexivity, anti-symmetry anti -symmetry and transitivity. Okay, so these all look a bit confusing, but uh, reflexivity just says that uh, essentially uh, the uh, a thing in itself are you know if you put the pair where both elements of the relation are itself that that is in the set uh, uh, in uh, that that is in the relation uh, the antisymmetric thing means that if you uh, have one that is less than the other and you swap it around and have the other being less than the one, then we get the same thing coming out. Oh, then, then, then we determine that they're equal. Okay. This only happens when those two things are equal. Uh, and by transitivity, that if one thing is less than or equal to another, oh, I can draw on this guy. If one thing is less than the other, uh, and that thing is less than a third thing, then we sort of transitively determine that A is less than C. Yeah. The little roof means and, right? The, the, oh, these little hat things. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Those are little hats. Those little, those little um, hats mean and. The similar thing for or is a little v like that. All right. Yeah. Okay. So this is a sort of binary type way of doing sort of binary stuff. Okay. Happiness. Happy with partial ordering. Yeah. You'll notice that there can be things in the set which do not compare. Okay, why well, that's what it that's why it is a partial ordering, not a total ordering. We haven't said that all things are comparable. Okay? Okay. All right, uh, uh Volker looking a bit confused at this point. I'm okay. You he's okay. I'm all right. I'm getting there. He's getting there. Okay. Uh so we then have a uh po set, a partially ordered set, which is any set which has a partial order defined over it. Okay? So you will hear people use po set around. This is what it means. It's just a set with a partial order. 
All right. Ger- for German, that sounds weird. <laughs> what, what should it? What does what does post no, just, mean? Just post is this it. some sex term that you're going to come up with, no, Pavlos? Well, no. <laughs> Good. Every German listening to this will exactly understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The rest of us very confused. Uh, I keep getting the wrong button. There we go. Okay. So. Ah, now this is a little bit more confusing. So we are going to introduce the idea of uh, a join semilattice. So this is a uh, uh, a partially ordered set that has a least upper bound, which we call a join. There is a, a meet, by the way, which we call uh, the greatest lower bound uh, for any non-empty finite subset. Okay. So it has a particular least upper bound, a single least upper bound. So if you start, if you take any subset of the things in the in the set, you can go up, and they will have a single point at which they join. Okay, that is unique. Does that make sense? Yes. A single point at which they join, for which there are no higher ones. We'll see some examples of things that break this rule in a bit, that therefore will not be joined semilattices. Okay. All right, and as I said, yes, uh, the meet semilattice is the uh, inverse of this. All right, so the rules for this, uh, there are some additional rules for this. We must have associativity, which we should all be sort of familiar with. This is this guy here, which is the same kind of thing that you get for uh, for multiplication and, and stuff like that and other sort of very basic things. Uh, commutativity, which means that you can do things in any order, which is going to be very useful for our data flow analysis because it means that the order that we do operations in isn't going to change the uh, final effects, uh, that this operator, uh, when applied to itself, uh, produces the same thing. This is idempotency. Uh, and we have this top element, which is a finite, which, which, because we have a top element, and this says that we must eventually, everybody has a single place where they must get to, and it doesn't go on uh, indefinitely for that. If you have a partially ordered set, how can you have a top element where every other element is... Um... Maybe I understood that wrong. So every, uh, every non-empty finite subset must have a least upper bound. So this guy is the, uh, oop, ah, sorry. Uh, so, so this guy, top, is the least upper bound for everybody. OK, even though there is no ordering for some of the elements. Ah, there's no ordering for every element, for, for, for all the elements, right? But they all must have a, an upper bound, which means that they must be, whilst they might not be comparable, you might have two things which are sort of incomparable to each other, but they have a another thing which they're all comparable to. All right, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Pablos, do you like this? Yeah. Pablos likes this. All right, my fan is starting to go. Why does my fan start going crazy like this? Okay. So, uh, yes, as I say, uh, a meat semi-lattice is basically the other way around, just that it's got a bottom element instead, and everybody can sort of come down to the bottom. Uh, and a complete semi-lattice, uh, which we just sometimes call a lattice, uh, has both uh, a bottom and a top. Mm-hmm. Okay? All right. And we often just talk about semi-lattices because we are just talking about one or the other. You know, we often only care about them being in one direction or the other. All right? Mm-hmm. Definitions. We love definitions, right? Fantastic. This is, this is what you came for, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah? Excellent. I feel very refreshed. <laughs> uh, still the wrong button. Okay. So here is an example of a uh, lattice. All right, so this lattice is for the, we, what we've got here is we've got the sets of all variables x, y, z. The, all the, all the, sorry, the set of, the, all the different sets of variables that you can make from x, y, and z. Okay? And what we've done is that the uh, thing, the, the lines here represent uh, the sort of less than uh, or equal to operator that we saw before. All right? Uh, and this says that this one has the which one is included in the one above. Okay, so if there's a line between you, so if we see this guy, now where did my little? Uh, if we see this guy, x y, that is fully included in this guy up here. All right, nice and easy. Uh, and we can see some transitivity, which means that this guy here, which is included, which is included here, we haven't drawn a line from here to here because we get it from the transitivity that we get from this guy, all right? So the typical thing is that depending on which direction you're going, you have, uh, you just put in the minimum number of lines that you want. These are called Haas diagrams, by the way, just for showing lattices. Um, and these show you how the, uh, the, the operator, the, the relations in the, in the set work. Okay? 
Okay. All right. This makes sense. Yep. Yeah. And you see that we have for any finite subset. Let's take this finite subset here. These three. Uh, we have a least upper bound. Mm -hmm. What is the least upper bound for this guy? Is the least upper bound in the set? No, it doesn't have to be in the set. No, 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 no. There is a least upper bound in the set, but it doesn't have to be. It's right in the entire set, but not in the finite subset. Not in the subset. That was my question. Okay. Otherwise, there would not be a least upper bound, right? So is the least upper bound in that case, why is that? Uh, well, that's interesting. What do you think? What do you think? I'd say the same. You'd say the same? Yeah. All right. Then we'll say yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So is this a lattice? Uh, yes, it is a lattice. We have a top element. We actually have a bottom element as well. We have finite subsets and so forth. So the, finite, so the lower bound is the empty set? The lower bound in this case is the for this one is the is the empty set. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So there we go. Uh, yes, it's a lattice. And this is actually the lattice for the live out thing that I think we discussed last time, which was the data flow equations for live out. Uh, and this shows how things move through the uh, data flow equations. Okay. All right. Here are some examples of things which are not lattices. Lattices. Okay. So let's take this one over here. And uh, uh, the first one on the left-hand side. All right, guys. Is that a lattice or not? No. Or rather, if it is not a lattice, given that it says not example non-lattices, that does make that question a bit easy, doesn't it? Oh, I thought I was clever seeing that. All right. Which which one? Do, which one, Pavlos? Which one do you want to take? And 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 then Volker. You're gonna you're gonna take the left one, are you? So I just take the Okay. All right. I'll take the right. All right. So uh, you start. No, no, you can say <laughs> uh, The left one does not have a common lower bound or common upper bound. Yes. So it's not a lattice. Yes. Well done. That was the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> well, they're both easy. Easy peasy. Okay. All right. So let's do the right one. Or rather, Pavlos, do the right one. Mm. Okay. So, mm, I don't know. So they have a, a lower bound, they have an upper bound, as it looks. Any other? Can we look at the definition again? <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, on the left-hand side, C and D have no common upper bound, right? On the right, on the left-hand side. Uh -huh. Yeah. And on the other side, B and C have common upper bounds, right? But if we take D, E, F, uh, sorry, sorry, have common upper bounds with all of these guys, but they have no least common upper bound, right? So these are the, co are the upper bounds of uh, C and B, but none of them is least. I see. Yeah? They must have a singular one. Like, yeah. All need to point to the same. I see. Okay. okay. Makes sense. Happiness? Mm -hmm. Yeah? All right. Phew. Made it through that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what conditions are required for dead for termination? Now that we've got our, some of our, uh, some of our stuff going through. All right. So, uh, what we're going to say is that each block or statement has a particular function which describes the uh, transfer function. Okay, so each block has a transfer function which is sort of created by the information that it contains. You could also think of it as a transfer function which takes the information in a block to work out how, as information flows through the data flow, it changes. Okay, so let f be the set of these transfer functions. All right, then sufficient terminations, uh, sufficient conditions for termination are that we have our value set over here and we have our, uh, our, our meet operator. And that we've got that this makes a semi lattice. All right. Uh, we must have that our set of functions has an identity operation uh, that is closed onto composition, which means that as you re repeatedly apply it, it produces things from the same set again. Uh, and that it's monotonic and that it goes, uh, which means that it gradually increases. 
Okay, uh, and that it's, by the way, this should be a finite semi-lattice. Which will then mean that as we progress through this thing, we will be taking steps and we can only take a finite set of steps because we're monotonic and uh, there's a finite distance we can go up. Okay, and since we have a, uh, a top element, we must eventually terminate. Does that make sense? Yeah. So either you hit a point at which your fixed point is earlier and it starts repeating itself, right? Or by the time it gets to the top, it can't go back down, so therefore it must be done. Okay? Oh, so monotonic doesn't mean repetitions aren't allowed? No, monotonic means that every time you apply the function, you might, you might not go backwards. It goes, strictly speaking, it's either the, it either you get the same result or you go upwards through the lattice. All right. All right? Since you can't go back down the lattice, and the lattice only has a finite number of levels, mm -hmm. then you either reach the top, at which point you can't go any further, so it must be then repeating itself up at the top, or at some point lower down you repeat. Okay? Okay. Okay. There are lots of lovely details in the book which you are expected to read, which is what you guys really wanted to have happen, isn't it? Yeah? We like that? Good. Okay. All right. So uh, let us look at some... New, now that we've seen what, what is required for uh, data flow termination, right? Pavlos is, is frowning. Are you frowning because um, you've forgotten to turn the cooker off, or is it because you don't understand what the hell I've been doing? Damn the cooker. <laughs> I don't understand anything. You don't understand anything? Mm -hmm. what, 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 what do you not understand? No, I'm just joking. Oh, you do understand? Yeah. All oh, right, okay, all right. I feel like I should have been here for the last lecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Liveness. So, uh, you've both done some compiler stuff. What is liveness? What what does live out mean? What does it mean if I say a variable is live out? Let me quickly read this slide. <laughs> That's so cheating. All right, I'm covering my hand over it. Do you know? I don't know. You don't know? Do you know? Go on, have a guess. What does it mean? What, Roughly. Yeah, what does it mean? Uh, so live out are the variables that... Uh, uh, are accessible by future instructions. Will be used at some point in the yeah. future. Yes. So if there is a use of a variable later in the control flow, in the execution flow, then that variable is live out of wherever it currently is. Okay? Okay. Makes sense? You can see how this would be quite a useful analysis to be able to have, a useful data flow analysis, because if you can work out which variables are not going to be used in the future, then you can throw them away, you can reuse their resources, which might be registers, or if, for example, if you know that you've uh, allocated some memory to it, you can deallocate that memory and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So quite nice and useful stuff to have. So uh, what are we going to do? We're going to look at how we build the data flow equations for this uh, for this, this thing. Uh, so live out is in opposition to dead. So it's either... Live out is in opposition to dead, yes. I get dead and I get life, but why out? Ah, because you can also have live in. Ah, I see. Right? So we're talking about live live out, telling me which direction it's it's coming from. Okay. Okay. All right. So yes, so a variable is live out. If there is some statement uh, that comes in a control path that comes out of this of the current statement that you're looking at, of the current point, rather, program point that you're looking at, which uh, is where it uses that variable. Okay, so the difference between a point and a statement is that you have a points on either side, the beginning and the end of a statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a small definition that we covered covered last time. All right. Otherwise, that variable is dead, and you can do things to get rid of it. Okay, so uh, in this case, in order to build our data flow, the previous data flows we looked at, the information flowed forwards. If you remember, Pavlos, we looked at reaching definitions, I think, last time. And in order to work out where a definition reached, we followed it from its point and we pushed the fact that that definition now exists forward in time through the data flow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at the uses of a variable and a value, a value is live right up until the time that it is used. After the last use, it's no longer live. So we're now going to be looking at, from uses. We're going to be going back in time, showing that those variables are live everywhere back in time from their uses. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. 
So this is going to be a backwards data flow as opposed to a forwards data flow like we saw last time. All right, so here is an example. Uh, so what I would like you to try and do, it, which of you is going to volunteer to be um, to be guinea pig for this? I do. Yeah? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to work out uh, which variables are live from various points. Okay? Okay. So we're going to start at the end here because it's a backwards day flow equation. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what variables are live out of here, which is the very bottom? So which ones? So live means I have used them? Means that there will be a use after this point. After this point? Yeah. So no variable. No variable. So we start with the empty set here, right? Uh, there we go. Put oh. the empty set in. Okay. All right. So now we've got a oh, uh, now we've got a point here. What variables are live out of there? Uh, sorry, blue and red. Blue means is that the direction is going, or so these are just to discriminate the different program points. This is a program point after the statement. This is the red ones are program points before the statement. Okay, so I can go from that point up to S four. So you can go up to S four. But at this point, you don't know what's live here. OK. OK. So at the moment, we're just going to ah, I've sort of skipped a step. So we, we're not going to know anything about that, right? So we're going to assume that these two are the same, that the, that, the, that the one that I've circled and the red one below, that they have the same value. OK. OK. So then we're going to come here. And I'm going to ask you, at this point here, which is also, by the way, going to be the same for this point here, because there, there's nothing that goes on in between them. I see. What is live out of those? Y and X, because I'm going to use Y and X in the next block. That's right. All right. OK, so there we go. So, Pavlos, do you want to have a go? Because it looks like you're falling asleep. And if you start snoring on this thing, I should be, uh, you know, it's going to ruin it all. Because obviously Ooh. this is, you know, it's going to ruin our production quality here, mate. <laughs> all right, so what about at this point? So it's uh, X, Y, and also C and A. Oh, now that's interesting. Is there a use of C here? Oh, you're right. I'm right. You're always right. I'm always right. We, we, this is well known, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so it should just be X, Y, and A, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. There we go, X, Y, and A. And we see that because there's sort of nothing interesting happening, that sort of meets all of those points. All right. Let's take this point here, Volker. That would be X, Y, and A. X, Y, and A. Is A live out here? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I use it later at S5, but at the red dot above S3, it, no, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's redefined, but it's also defined in S1. The question is, is uh... it's not now? Now this is not reaching definitions, right? Like the definition of A in S1 reaches here, but the question is, is this A live out at this point? You mean the A from S1? Is is that? Yes. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not because it's about to get squashed. But I'm using it in S5. I use the S, the A from S3 and S5. Yes, but that's the different value. That's, a that's different. the A from S3. So if it's defined in there, I basically don't know anything about it. The, if it's defined in here, if it's defined, this this does what this is, kills it from the uh, from the data set, right? Okay, if it's killed, it's from in the, the y. Yes. So it's X and Y. Yes. So it's X and Y. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, Pablo's closed your eyes. I just want to see whether we've done the next one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we have done the next one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, what about this one here? So it's... Which is the red dot before S4. Yeah. So it's uh, just X, Y, and A. X, Y, and A. I see. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense. All right. So, uh, Falk, close your eyes, because I can't remember which one we're going to next. I'm closing my eyes. Uh... All right, you're going to have quite a few to do then. All right, so um, so what do we know about this one here? Uh, definitely X and Y. And also A. 
I see a B there, but it's not defined anywhere above, so it doesn't really... Well, this B is n not used it's anyway. Not, it's not used at all. So I would say X, Y, and A. X, Y, and A. All right. And what about this point here? What about it? Well, does it tell us anything about... We're going backwards from... You notice that this kind of has an arrow here. It's yeah, supposed yeah. to have an arrow there. It doesn't have an arrow there, but it's supposed to. Is that It's supposed to come out of here and come into here, right? Okay. So, and because we're doing backwards, we're pushing this X, Y, A along this edge here to here. Okay. Right? So this now, which was the empty set, becomes X, Y, A. Huh. Right? So if I'm there... It might happen that I don't use anything at all. So, and you can tell this, right? Because at this point, right, out of here, you are going to use A here from S5 and use XY, right? Yeah. So at this point, XYA is live out. Yeah. Right? And you do that by pushing it along here. Okay. Okay? And um, Pavlos, what about this one here? Um, X Y A, X Y A. All right. Oh, uh, uh okay. <laughs> Pavlos, what about this one here? X Y, X Y. Yes, because A has been not uh, is is the the killed there. All right. Okay. Why do I do that? Why Why do you do what? <laughs> the whole thing. Why do you do the whole thing? Because you want to know what thing when what variables are live out at which points in the program. Why does that help me? Well, so so as I said previously, right? If they are, if they have resources allocated to them, right? You can't get rid of those resources whilst they're live. I see. Right. Like for like garbage collection, for example. Garbage collection for yeah. things like if I want to assign registers to things, right? If I do register allocation, I need oh, yes. to know when things are live. Yeah. Because if I start, otherwise I can't reuse those registers. Uh, you said that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're all happy. Why is X, Y red? Okay, I'll show you why X, Y, Z red in, in a bit. But just note that X, Y here are used, right? They're live out, but they live out on entry, which means that we potentially don't have definitions for them. Okay. Right? That make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this live out analysis can also tell you things like you've used something which has never been defined. Okay? Now, this guy here, if we take this thing here, which Volker, you worked out by pushing the information back there, right? We noticed that previously we had x, y up here, right? Mm -hmm. Only now, if you push this up through s, if you push this set x, y, a up through s6, you should get x, y, a there. Yeah. Only it's just as x, y. Yeah. So this is a kind of a, like the state is not yet settled. We have not yet reached a fixed point because repeated application of our functions is leading us to change what our set of information is. Okay. Yeah? Okay. So we have to go and do this again. So what should this be? X, Y, A. X, Y, A. All right. All right. So there we go. And it turns out if you do that again and push, the, push X, Y, A up through S5, you get no change here because you've already got X, Y, A. And then... It turns out that you can do as many more of these things as you like. You're always going to get the same set. Okay. Okay. And we will have reached a fixed point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So we will have noticed that uh, B and C, B, using this thing, we will have noticed that B and C are, if we actually, if we combined uh, uh, some of our analysis, right? Um, actually, so just using this, we notice that B and C are defined, but they're not live out even of themselves. Yeah. Which means that this definition yes. is completely pointless. Right? So is this definition. Oh, I see. So we could then, by knowing the live outs, this is again answering your question about uh, what use is this. So you're, you're maybe used to dead code elimination going along and saying, there's no control flow which reaches this statement, therefore I don't need this statement, right? Noticing that somebody has done essentially if false, right? Yes. That then get, means you don't have to have that the, the body of that if. Yes. Right. Here, you see that we can get dead code because the definitions aren't used, 
we can then mark that instruction as being dead okay. and remove it. Okay. Right? And then we might want to redo our analysis. Yeah? Because if I kill S5 and S4, then A, we change what's, uh, what's, we might, we might have changed what uses are, are around. Right? Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pavlos is frowning. This is just hoping when, when is this over? Have you had lunch yet? Is that the problem? I'm falling asleep. <laughs> Pavlos, Pablo, how much sleep did you get last night? Two hours. Two hours. That is that is the kind of wild life that an internet sensation and sex god leaves. That lives, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not it's, it's not surprising. All right. So we uh, <laughs> we uh, you were clearly enjoying that I <laughs> by the looks of it. <clears throat> All right. So there we go. So that's live. We we have intuitively pushed around a a liveness analysis, right? And we're happy with this. And we have noticed a few things. We noticed that when things met like here, that we uh, did a union of the sets. We have an idea of uh, what a definition does to kill something. Mm -hmm. And we have an idea of that a use makes a... Uh, generates elements into the set, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Pavos, remember yeah. gen and kill sets? What? Remember gen and kill sets from... It was only five months ago. Yeah, I just only remember that. Yeah, excellent. There we go. All right. Fortunately, our listeners will be more familiar with this stuff. Maybe. All right. Okay, so now we're going to design the data flow equations for this. And what we will say is that the outset is going to be defined from the inset as the union of the successors. So this is, remember, we were talking about when things meet, right? We're pushing things up from the successors. And we're going to do the union. So this is just the mathematical version of that. Okay. Out is determined is the union of the ins. Uh, so we now, uh, the transfer is this guy here. And we take the things that, that are coming from our out point, right? The, what was that, the blue dot or the red dot? I can't remember whether that was the blue dot or the red dot. From our blue dots, right? And in order to work out how they trans, how the information transfers upwards, to our in, yeah, we do it like this. In is the things that were out. Take away some things that you kill, and uh, oh no, kill is defined later. Sorry. Ki yes, ki taking away the things that you kill and adding the things that you generate. All right. And this is a kind of standard form for uh, this is a kind of standard form for uh, for lots of data flow equations. So we can express it like that. The gen set is uh, we're going to generate something into the set if we use it, right? Okay? And uh, we're going to kill things which are defined but not used. Okay. All right? And we start with, we started with empty knowledge. Yeah? Okay. okay? So you see that actually you were able to do a data flow analysis by just looking at a graph and working out what it should be, and going from your intuitive understanding of this to the actual mathematics of it is really quite straightforward, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? You'd be able to do this in an exam? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Good. You know, I, I, maybe... Do, do, do you think an, an, an audio thing of you guys spending two hours in silence doing an exam would be a good, uh, a good thing for the, for, the, for the show? Only if you have really loud pens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so that we've just seen uh, a backwards data flow. There are lots and lots and lots of data flows. Data flows is based, data flow analysis is essentially like the bedrock of compiler optimization. Okay, this is the thing that allows us to essentially tell everything pretty much about what's going on inside your program. There's so much text on that slide. There is so much text on the slide. Well, okay, so yes, so Falker is saying that probably because he's aware that I I, I get quite shouty at people who write um, slides <laughs> with lots of text, right? Uh, but yes, in this case, this is in lieu of uh, lecture notes, <laughs> right? Because I couldn't be bothered to do lecture notes and slides. So this is, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. Also, also I inherited a sort of first version of these slides, and then just decided I wasn't going to change too much. I thought you were just making a point that there's so many... Of them. Oh, that's that's what I was doing. Yes, yes, yes. This is to give you the idea that there are lots uh, lots of them. Should we go through some of them? Yeah, of course. Yeah, should we talk about them? Okay. Constant propagation. Okay, so this is uh, when you have a an assignment statement of a constant and then a copy operation, then uh, where... Sorry, actually, I suppose this should be... Oh, what happened there? Well, actually, this should be sort of 
y equals x, right? Or y equals constant. Actually, either of these two things, that these propagate their constantness around, right? So in this case, we know if we knew that y is constant, then we would know that thereafter x is constant. Yeah? Make sense? Now, you can imagine that uh, what happens if two of these constant bits of information, if we know that x is constant on two paths that join together, then it will be constant afterwards only if the two constants that were there were the same. Right? So if you imagine from one path, the constant is x is 1, and on the other path, x is 10, it's not constant when they join together. It's either x or 10, and that's not constant. Okay. Yeah? Uh, if they're both the same, then they're, then, then they're the same. So you have the idea that the, that the, that the, the meet operator says if both are constant and the same, then it's the constant and that with that value. If either one of them is not a constant, then it's not a constant. So right? meet in the sense of meeting. The it's the yeah the meet yeah the, when the when the when we sort of meet the two, yes we we have the it, so as we, so we discussed this unfortunately last lecture I, for I you should have seen the other yeah uh, which we have we have transfer right functions right and and meet operators okay. right which describe how the data flow merge the meet operators describe how the data flow merges together. I was thinking of meat as in lunch. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Both of you should have eaten before coming down here. This is the. This is. Oh God. All right. Um, so you often hear people not talking about constant propagation, but you'll hear them talking about constant folding. Um, and uh, actually, they are two different things. But we tend to not bother talking about them as two different things. Constant folding is something slightly different. Where uh, if you know that you've got a plus b and A and B are both constants, then you can work out what A plus B is at compile time, mm -hmm. and that's folding the constants together. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Copy propagation uh, is allowing you to know that this variable and that variable are the same because they're copies and that they refer to the same value at the same time. Okay. Right? Uh, available expressions are the set of expressions that you have computed through all paths that reach a point. Okay, so if you know that, then you know that you don't have to recompute it. Whereas if there are some paths where you don't have it, then you have to, you might have to recompute it. Yeah. Expressions like x plus y. X plus y. Yes. If you've got x plus y coming in through everywhere, you can reach a point. X plus y has been calculated. If you then see x plus y again, you know that you can reuse it from before. All right. Okay. Right. If it doesn't come in through all paths, if there's some path where x plus y is not calculated, then you would have to calculate it yourself or make that other path calculated as well. All right. Okay. Uh, very, very busy expressions are expressions that are evaluated on all paths leaving a block. So if everybody outside me, uh, everybody after me, calculates the same expression, then maybe I could hoist that code into my block, which would mean that then maybe they all wouldn't have to calculate it and we could have it in fewer places. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh, definite assignment is working out that a variable is... Uh, always assigned before use, which you can imagine would be quite useful if you want to check that people aren't uh, doing operations on undefined variables. Uh, redundant expressions and partially redundant expressions. So a uh, redundant expression is one where you have it, where you have a definition of something, and the expression that is there is available, right? Okay, because then it's redundant because you've already got it elsewhere. Oh, I see. Right? A partially redundant expression is one where there is at least one path coming in which already computes that expression. Is that not the same as available expression? No, 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 no. The available expression doesn't say that you have a definition of that thing also here. Right? Also, so, okay, so imagine we've got a control flow like this. All right. Okay. And now, if, if here I've got... Uh, uh, if I've got C equals uh, A, <laughs> this is very hard. I should get a touch screen for this. A plus B. All right. And if I've got C equals A plus, I'm going to C equals A plus B up there. I'm just going to there go. C uh, and C equals A plus B up here as well. All right. Okay. Then not only is A plus B um, busy uh, available. I beg your pardon. Right. But because it's def because it's it is uh, computed here as well, it is redundant because it's also computed up here, okay, and up here, right? Now, if it were only computed in one of these, say not in that one, 
then it would be partially redundant because it is computed through some path previously rather than here. Okay. okay. I might be able to add it up here, but add it back in there, right? And to make it fully redundant, and then I could possibly kill it from here. Okay. Okay? All right. There are lots and lots and lots of different data flow equations. They're used for everything, for alias analysis to actually, you name it, they're named, they're pretty much, pretty much all things, type analysis, pretty much everything inside the compiler starts with some kind of data flow equation. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you should read the book. You, by the way, if you are part of my course, you should read the book to find out all of the data flow equations that there are. What was the book, the name of the book? The Engineering a Compiler by uh, Linda Torkson and Keith Cooper. Okay. Okay. Beautifully written book. I send them my pen. And available, I think, online, so you don't even have to buy it. Which is good. It might be. I don't know whether it is. You mean legally available online? I, well, it's definitely available online. I don't know whether it is legally available online. Yeah, okay. Pablos is now going to check his um, pirate account. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, good. All right. Let's look at another very simple data flow equation and uh, a concept which is going to be incredibly useful for us in all of our compiler theory. Okay. And whenever you look at compilers, you will see that dominators are things that people talk about. So it's good to get a firm grasp in your mind about what dominance is about. Yeah? And Pavlos, it's not what you're thinking. I know you were up late last night, but I don't want to hear about it, right? Okay, you did say that you were going to leave that stuff uh, at home and uh, and not discuss it. <laughs> Pavlos has just drifted off now as he remembers last night. <laughs> <laughs> Pablo, you know, I really do wish you hadn't been wearing the leather chaps today. Uh, <laughs> the gimp mask was just a little bit too far. Uh, okay, so... You know, surprisingly... <laughs> <laughs> Have you not seen him come in in the morning? <laughs> All right, so, uh, dominators. So we say that a CFG node, uh, which could be a statement or a basic block, dominates some other node... Uh, and we write it like this with these uh, with these double chevrons. If and only if every path that you can get to from the start of the CFG to the dominated node has to go through the dominating node. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, now you can probably already see why this is kind of going to be useful, right? Because this means that if you've got stuff that you want to arrange to happen in this node, you could put it in the dominator, right, in any dominating node, and it will definitely be calculated there, yeah. right, which allows you lots of sexy code motion type things to do. We all love code motion. I guess you guys dream about it at night, right? Is that Absolutely. right? Yeah? Yeah. 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 Good. All right. So we are going to, because this is going to be quite useful for us working out things like, uh, you know, where we can put stuff and what we, what kind of optimizations we can do, we're going to design a very, very simple data flow equation to do it, right? This is one of the most simple data flow equations to do, it, all right? So we've got a definition of what, uh, what this is. Who would like to tell me what direction they think this data flow will be in. Will it be forward or backward? Backward. What do you think? I'm thinking forward. <laughs> Sideways. Fight! <laughs> Fight! Sideways. I want some kind of gladiatorial combat here. Uh, what direction it is? Forward. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, as you can imagine that we are going to be pushing the dominator information. Like, I know that uh, I know who has got to me so far, right? So, what you should, in order to answer these questions, Bo, you should think about, you know, what would you actually do in order to follow the data flow around on this graph, right? So, did we have a? So, if we imagine here, right? We've, we've actually here we've worked out what the what the uh, dominating sets are. So, why don't, we, why don't we go through one of these, right? So, how would you actually work out this dominating set? This, this, this dominating information, all right? So we would start up here and we'd say, this guy must dominate this guy, right? Because every path from him, I mean, he is the start node, so he does that, right? Also, by the way, you'll notice from this definition that uh, a node dominates itself because every path through the CFG to this guy must go through, him, through, through this guy must go through himself, right? Okay. okay, so there we go. So we see that this guy here dominates himself, all right? And we see that this guy here, well, he, every node dominates himself. And we know that B0 dominates him because the only way you can get to him, right, 
every path from the start to him must go through the start. Yeah? So actually we'll find that B0, being the start node in this case, will dominate everybody. Okay. Right? Since everybody from him must go through him. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So we kind of push this information forwards down to here, right? And you see here on B2, well, the only way to get to B B2 from B0, you must go through B0 and B1. And every node dominates himself. So I just carry all those nodes around all the time? Yes. Right. The more interesting thing is going to be so. So we we're, we're starting to get a feeling, perhaps, for what the transfer function is going to be. Right. Yeah. As you, if you've got some things that dominate here, what's the dominate thing going to be out here? Well, you add the current node. You add the current node. So the so the transfer function is going to be to add the current node. Okay. Right? Okay. So we. Oh, sorry. That's uh, all right. There we go. Well, I'll probably delete that off the uh, thing. Uh, all right. Um, so, more interesting is going to be what we have for uh, outputs of these guys, right? Okay, so if we've got down this edge here, right, we've got B0, B1, and B2, which are these guys here. And down this edge here, we've got B1, B5, and B7, right? Now, what is the operator going to be to merge those two guys together? Cut. Cut, well, what? You cut one set against the other, and you keep the ones that are the same. What does that mean? So cut, what's the sort of more standard sort of definition of cut for oh. people who understand basic mathematics and things like that? <laughs> I thought that's it. What, for basic set theory, I mean, what, do you, what, what is it called? Paulus. <laughs> and? Intersection. <laughs> Jesus Christ, guys. That's basically the same At least word. he has an excuse. He's been to his bondage club all night. What the hell's your excuse? <laughs> Intersection <coughs> on these. Okay. All right. So in, Ger in Germany, you would say schnitt, which means cut. <laughs> but also intersection, to be honest. But, uh, That's it. This, is a, this is a fine excuse from you two. Is I know, I'm, right? I'm, I'm foreign. Fantastic. What do I know? It's the best excuse yeah, ever. My England is not Sorry, that good. this was my language. <laughs> my, not, my England not my is not that good. <laughs> good. Nice one. Nice one. All right. Okay. Well, we can do it in German if you like. We're not going to get very far, but you'll have to do it yourselves. All right. So we've worked out what the meet function is and what the transfer function are probably going to be. Uh, and the initial values... Uh, well, we realise we probably didn't need to have anything to start with, except for maybe. Or what do we have? Oh, well, no, it's in, we we probably because it's because it's intersection. What do we think the initial values are going to be? The initial value of the of the next node. No, no, yeah. So, what do you start with as you do this? So, in the previous one, we started with it initially. Sort of the the initial information about something was that it was empty. Yes. Right. So that when you met with something that you hadn't, when you, when you had a meet, and you didn't know the, the previous one had a union in it, right? The meet operation for live out, the union, the the meet operator was union, right? Mm -hmm. So you imagine the sit. What we need to know is what's going to happen when I have a meet where I know the value from one of the uh, one direction, right? So we've got a thing like this, right? And we. Uh, and we want to know what goes on here, right? We've got the information from this guy, but this guy we've got nothing yet. This tells us what a, this will work out what our information, what our initial values need to be, right? Now, when this was a union, we wanted this guy to be the empty set. I'm trying to do like that, which is a terrible, all right? You know, empty set, right? Mm -hmm. So that when we do the union, the information was just that. It was just this guy up here, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But now we have intersection. So what should my initial value be? Well, probably every node in the set. Everything, right? So this should be the whole thing, the universe. I don't understand how. So that's what I have at the initial node at B. No, 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 no. I mean B0. the initial. The, no, no, oh, no, no, no. So slight different. Slight different thing. No, no. Talk about the initial settings of the graph. Right, the initial the initial uh, sets that you have attached to these, right? Like the default value before you. So you so you get it. your graph and you put an initial set on every node and yes. then you start your algorithm. Yes. I see. Okay. Yes. Okay. So in this case, we want it to be everything, except we would have a problem with the start node if we had everything. Then it would start up here. If you had everything up here, then you'd add B zero to itself. Yeah. So for the initial one, you want right here at this point up here before the before the entry. 
You want nothing. You want nothing or it's all the first note, right? Okay. So we've got direction forward. The value set, what's the value set? What are the values that we're pushing around here? Nodes. Sets of basic blocks or nodes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sets of nodes. Okay. Sets of nodes. The transfer function we decided was union yeah. with yourself. Un union the set with your with with that guy, right? With your own node. Uh -huh. Okay. The meet we decided was intersection of all predecessors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the initial values were everything. Oop. Uh, everything for everybody except the start node. Okay. All right. Which, depending on how we do it, is either empty or contains the the start node himself. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. All good. Fantastic. We've just designed a data flow equations. Oh, that's yeah. Actually, it's simple. I bet you could do this in an exam, couldn't you? No problem. Yeah, Pavlos. Yeah, he's a busy. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Okay. Oh. I love those slides. So let's have some. We yeah, definitions are great, aren't they? These are these are. These are things you have to learn if you're going to do the exams, right? But this is also the great bit is that everybody falls asleep. I think now, allergic against blue. Now the thing is, the thing is, right? In, in normally in my lectures, I give people biscuits and things like that. Although I think in in this case, the only thing that would work with Pavlos would be uh, amphetamines or something like that to keep him awake. But um, I haven't bought any biscuits or amphetamines, Pavlos. I'm sorry about that. So you're not going to have any of that. All right. So let's just go through them quickly so that um, so that Pavlos doesn't fall asleep. A uh, so we've seen what dominators are. A post dominator is basically the kind of uh, the inverse of this right so a node is said to post dominate another node if all parts to the if all paths to the exit have to go through that node okay. right okay it's just a kind of the inverse idea of this we have an idea of strict dominance which is you know we said how a node dominates itself right a node strictly dominates you if it's dominates you but it's not you okay right why do we have a special definition for that uh just because you often don't want to sort of like if you've got to if you want to move something into a dominator, mm. you don't want to move it into yourself. Uh, there's no point moving it into yourself, right? So you might want to instead move things into a strict dominator. Yeah, well, but, uh, my, I'm, I'm asking why we just we call it dominators except to yourself. Why well, you don't call it that? Because strict sounds better, <laughs> and I would have thought that after your fetishes that you've been talking about, that this would be right up your street. <laughs> Uh, so we have uh, an immediate dominator, which is uh, the node that dominates you, uh, but not any other node that strictly dominates you. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it will turn out, and we'll see shortly, that these immediate dominators can be built into it. Oh, in fact, we're about to define it, right? Uh, these immediate dominators make a tree, a dominance tree, uh, which tells us where we can go to get the immediate dominators, right? Okay, mm -hmm. and we have a dominance frontier, which is maybe a little bit more complicated. Which we're going to see some uh, before public. You know, uh, Folk is looking a bit scared at this point. Uh, we are going to have some 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 examples of these things shortly. All right. So a dominance frontier is the set of nodes uh, such that uh, the node is dominates by an immediate predecessor of it, but does not strictly strictly dominate it. All right. Don't worry, we'll see it in a second. We'll see it in a second. We'll all, it will all become clear. All right, so let's have a look at the uh, dominator tree. All right, so um, we see this is the graph that we had earlier. All right, and I have drawn in in on. So here's here's the graph. This side, the left side's got the graph that we had earlier. The right side has got the dominance tree. Uh, I've got some grey paths here, which are just to the the remaining. Uh, arrows from the other side, but they're not part of the dominance tree. And these red ones are the immediate dominators, but you will notice that these edges are not edges in this graph over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is just to point out that uh, whilst sometimes the edges that you see in, an in, an, in a dominator tree are the same edges that you have in the original graph, uh, sometimes they are completely different. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay. So, Volker. Pavlos. No, Pavlos, because Volker did the last one, I think. Okay. All right. So does this does this all make sense, by the way? Do you see how these things immediately dominate? Mm -hmm. Should we have a look through the... Should we remind ourselves what the, the definition of immediate dominators was? All right. So the immediate dominator of N... Uh, immediate, the IDOM of N strictly dominates N, but not any other node that strictly dominates N. Mm -hmm. All right. So you remember that? Yeah. Okay. Should we check that this is... That I've got this right, because I've probably, I've probably made some mistakes here, right? So... 
Let's look at this one because this okay, one looks so this one looks interesting, right? For B three, the only nodes that uh, dominated strictly dominated are uh, B zero and B one. B zero and B one, yes. And uh, B one does not do, uh, dominate the B zero. Yeah. So it can be, uh, and uh, what we call it, emitted. Immediate dominator? It can be, yes. Yeah. Yeah. While B0 dominates B1, yeah. so it cannot be an immediate, an immediate dominator. Yes. So that only leaves us with B1 being the immediate dominator of yeah. B3. There will always be, by the way, only one. Yeah. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. <clears throat> but B1 also... Is B1 also the, the immediate dominator of B2? Yes. Okay. Which is why there is a yes, and and it is for that reason that I put this thick line here. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. So you, so you essentially work out all the nodes that strictly dominate it, right? And then one of those will not strictly dominate anything else in that set. Oh, if you go back. Sorry, I was confused. Uh, B one is also the immediate dominator of B two, but B two does not strictly dominate B three. Does neither strictly nor. It does not dominate it in any way. Yeah. Remember the yes, uh, right. You have to, okay because yeah, the yeah, definition yeah. of dominance is that the only way I can get to B three from the start node, yes, right, it is through the dominators, yes, yes, right? yes. And there's another way to get to B three, which is from this path over here with going through this lot over here. So B two is does not dominate it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So. What we would like to do is to work out what the dominator frontiers are. Okay. So let's just quickly remind ourselves what the dominator frontiers are. Dominator frontiers are the node are the set of nodes that that node dominates an immediate predecessor of that node, but does not dominate that node itself. Okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not even close. <laughs> All right. Let's look at. Let's look at intuitively. It's going to be basically where you leave the dominance, right? So if I look at the dominance frontier for B five, right? What I want to work out is what are the edges of his dominance. Of B 5s dominance. Yes. Okay. Okay. So he dominates all of these guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, going back to the thing, it's a set of nodes D such that he dominates an immediate predecessor of D, right? But does not dominate, but does not strictly dominate D. All right. So we're looking at the bits. So this guy. So this guy, right? Oop. He dominates an immediate. So does 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 B five? I think it's B five. Hold on, how do we? Uh, B five, B five. Does not dominate B three, but he dominates an immediate predecessor of B three. I see. Yeah. That's what the. <laughs> okay. So uh, perhaps a more intuitive way to look at this is to look at all the things you dominate, right? And then all the things that are immediately coming out of that. Yeah. Or the dominance frontier. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, there we go. We see the things that he immediately dominates, right? And there we go. This is the immediate dominant frontier. Ah! What happened there? Okay? If we look at B1, we have a slightly different situation. We notice that the dominance frontier here is himself. The dominance frontier is always a node. Yes, because we look at or, or, or or multiple. multiple nodes, right? Seven, Possibly multiple nodes, nodes, right? Okay. So we look here at these are the guys that he dominates, right? There is an edge coming out of this dominating set, mm -hmm. and he doesn't dominate. He doesn't strictly dominate himself, right? So he's the dominator. He's in the dominance frontier. Okay. Okay. All right. Great, we've done dominators. Do you feel like you, like you know everything about dominators? Any questions about dominators? Other than how much you have to pay them, Pavlos. <laughs> Are you wondering why you agreed to come to these things? 
Yeah. You've been wondering. You've been wondering about that for every for every one that we've done so far, haven't you? <laughs> it's it's a good job we don't get to. Uh, it's a good job that I'm the one who edits out the. Uh, <laughs> you get to edit these things. All right. Okay. So dominators. That was dominators. Right. Let's look at uh, SSA form. Single, uh, static single assignment form. All right. So um, the fact that you allow definitions to redefine to be redefined in data flow equations sometimes makes life a bit difficult, right? Because you now have to work out which definition you're talking about, right? Which is a bit painful sometimes, okay? You have to work out use def chains and all these kind of things, like where is the use, where are, it, where are these definitions used and where is that definition used and which use, which definitions can reach this use and all this kind of stuff, right? Before you work out how things go together, okay? It makes the meet operators and the transfer functions quite difficult sometimes, okay? What you can do instead is to change things so that what we'd like to do is to make sure that a variable is only defined once, right? That makes sense, right? So static, the, the the actual there's only one definition of a piece of uh, of a variable in the text once, right? Now it can go through a loop, but there's only one statement that defines each variable. Okay, so we are going to transform a program where you've got multiple definitions of a variable into a program which has more variables. But each of those variables is defined only once. Okay? Okay. All right. That's what we're going to be doing here. So, in SSA, uh, one variable per definition. Uh, each use can therefore refer to only one definition, right? which makes our life very much easier. But we now have a problem where you originally had uh, two versions of X, say. Two variables had uh, one variable which had two definitions. They are now used at some point later. You've got now two definitions of the same variable. Right, which is very upsetting. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a new uh, idea, a new type of statement called a phi function, which explicitly defines this notion of uh, these two definitions being merged. And these phi functions will execute instantaneously in parallel, uh, which is just something to note for later, for actually the side lecture, which we aren't going to do today. Okay. Uh, there's an enormous look of joy on these guys' faces as they realize they don't have to sit here for that much longer. Okay, so um, let's have a look at an example. So we want to get rid of all the variables here. We want to get rid of all the multiple definitions here. All right. So we can see that A is defined twice. Right. We would like to get rid of that double definition. Okay. So the first thing we can do is we can uh, rename those variables uh, into A1 and A2. Or something like that. Or maybe A1 and A3. I don't know. I can't remember how I've done it. Let's have a look. Uh, yes, OK. We call them A1 and A2. But now we've got a problem here where A1 reaches here and A2 reaches here. So this use of A, we don't know whether it should be A1 or A2. Yeah? Mm -hmm. OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in a phi function. This phi function says... If you come down this path, then it will be A2. If you come down this path, then it will be A1. Mm -hmm. All right? So we'll often see five functions written like this uh, in textbooks and things like that. If you look in compilers, they will often say not just, say, for example, if you look inside LLVM, it will say A2 with this basic block and a1 from this basic block, so that we know which predecessor we are talking about. Okay, so this is a control flow dependent function. Okay, which we have in lots of compilers. What happened to A3? A3, we will we will see A3. We will see A3 in a second. Oh, that's, a very, that's a very good question. A so I've called this A4, right? So here we go. We've got A4 equals this new thing, and now we appear to have no problem, right? Because now we know which which one is there. The control flow thing will. We'll work that out, okay? But now, uh, uh, but now, A4 reaches up here, right? Oh. And A1 reaches here, right? Which is going to cause us a problem because now that would mean that A1 and A4, we don't know what to do with A4 there. We've missed it, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to put in another phi function, well, there's my A3. Good catch. Which merges A1 down here 
and a4 down here. And we're going to, we previously had a1 there. We're going to replace that with a3, which is the one that comes down here. Okay? Okay. So we've done this. And now we have removed all multiple definitions of the variables. You see, we've got these five functions here, which are control flow dependent and merge around, right? We happy with that? Do you feel like you could, you could turn a gra turn a, a set of things into into SSA form? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. So is there a forward analysis then? Uh, this is a this is not an analysis. So this is going to require me to use a bunch of analyses first, oh, right. like liveness and stuff like that. But this is a transformation as opposed to an, an analysis. But does it go forward? Do the analyses go forward? Oh no, you said it's instantaneous and parallel. Oh, ah, the the instantaneous and parallel bit. That these things that as you enter a block, all the five functions in the block are executed all at once. Ah, I see. Okay. Okay. Just just in a block, right? So when we enter the block, all the five functions work at once. We will see later that this will we'll see not today, but in another lecture we'll see that this this causes some problems as we try to come out of SSA form. Right? But we'll deal with that another another time. Okay. Okay. So uh, there we go. We happy with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like it? Mm -hmm. this, does this make it all worthwhile? Yeah. Pavlos, is this honestly? Is this? Wouldn't you rather be doing this stuff than um, going out and partying and things like that? Yeah. Why would I do that? <laughs> Why would you do this? Yeah. Why would you do the SSA form? Yeah. Okay. Because it makes a whole bunch of data flow analyses easier. Uh, okay. All right. A whole bunch of analyses that you can do become easier because you know that at this point here, uh, A4, you know that there is only one A4. Okay. And I already know which one it is. And you already know which one it is. And you don't have to go and work out where in the code all those things come from. Okay. Right. Now, actually, this is an interesting point because you will see that sort of pointer analyses uh, uh, arrays and stuff like this, um, we start to lose that information here, right? Uh, and there are, it turns out, there are more complicated things which we aren't going to talk about here because they become more complicated. There are array SSA and things like that which enable us to do the same kind of thing for the internals of arrays and things like this. Right? Okay. Okay. But we, we like this, yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Okay. All right. So, um, there are lots of different. So you see that we 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 did this this by by hand, right? Uh, and what you can do is go along and put all the. You can be profligate with your five functions and slap them all over the place, uh, and then you can. Um, there are different types of SSA. One of which is sort of maximal F, 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 SSA, which puts five functions all over the place and doesn't really worry about it. Okay, but then those the more that we get of them can make our analysis a bit slower. Minimal SSA, which uh, places five nodes for every variable uh, at every join point where you know that you've actually got multiple reaching definitions. All right? So maximal one does it whether or not there are multiple, puts five functions in whether or not there are multiple defin reaching definitions, which mm -hmm. essentially adds in potentially a bunch of useless uh, things. So if the same expression would reach from different paths, yes. minimal wouldn't do it. Minimal wouldn't do it unless there are multiple de reaching definitions of the same thing, right? But now we haven't really looked at whether or not those things are used, yeah? So we might have five functions because there are two reaching definitions, but if those variables are not used thereafter, then we are wasting a five, func five definition, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay? So semi-pruned uh, eliminates things that are not live after the uh, just just in the block boundaries. Okay, just looking at the, at the block by itself, right? So if you've got a definition of that thing later in the block, then you can get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and pruned SSA uses a full liveness analysis to be able to remove redundant finites. Okay? Yeah, okay, so those hopefully those things are all fairly clear. I hope we probably don't need to go into them in more detail. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> thank God for that. Okay, all right. <laughs> So uh, we're going to very quickly sketch the liveness, uh, how we go out of SSA uh, into normal code again, because obviously there are no phi, no phi instructions in ARM or in Intel, right? The closest thing you can get is a copy, but we'll see that those cause some trouble, okay? We're going to go through this very briefly, and then in a sort of additional lecture, we'll do some more information about it, okay? okay? All right. So... Uh, what we're going to do to come out of SSA is we take each definition uh, of x in a block. 
Oh, sorry, this is conversion to FSSA. Sorry, sorry, we've done it. Sorry, beg your pardon. Oops, sorry, I misread the thing at the top. Ah! All right, so uh, how we do it, uh, the basic thing is we take every addition and addition on block and we add a five function uh, for every block in the dominance frontier. This is going to introduce ourselves more definitions as we saw. So we're going to repeat that, pushing them around as we did just manually, uh, just, just intuitively ourselves, uh, and we rename the variables. If your liveness analysis is cheaper, if you don't do liveness analysis at all, then you can do this in order n time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, if your liveness analysis is not cheap, then you have to keep doing the liveness analysis as you change things, which makes life a little bit more complicated. Okay. Okay? Because you're reaching definitions, yeah, yeah, okay, so there we go. Your reaching definitions are easier because you do those once, but your liveness analysis will change each time you add new definitions, right? Okay, so conversion out of SSA, and we are almost done with the lecture, by the way. C to convert out of SSA, we can't just remove the, the phi nodes, right? You might think that, well, we could just remove those phi nodes and we would get and, and unname the variables, right? And then, then we would be left with the same code. And certainly in the guy that we had before, with this, if I just take out the phi node statements, and remove the subscripts for those variables, we're left with the code that we got, which we had initially, yeah. right? So the problem is, though, that there are lots of optimizations which bugger this up, right? Which we will see next lecture, okay? So we're going to just very briefly sketch it this lecture. Uh, and what we're going to do instead is we're going to work out how to, we're going to, it's, what we want to do is replace the phi nodes with copy operations. Copy operations are the closest match we get to a phi node. Right, but we need to put them in the basic blocks that are the predecessors. Okay, mm -hmm. so because it's control flow dependent, if we and we'll see this in a second, if we move this here and we put in this point here a four equals a two, and here we put a four equals a three, then that essentially encodes the same thing that we've got here with my control flow dependent instruction, which I don't have a real counterpart to in real in instruction sets, yeah? Okay. Okay? So, that's kind of what we want to do. Uh, but we are going to have some trouble sometimes where we might need to split edges because we uh, optimizations have made things difficult for us. Uh, so we'll do a bit of, we'll do a bit of nasty uh, fix-up. Uh, we'll then d delete the remaining phi nodes because we because they're now redundant, and we'll use some we'll use some subsequent analysis for if we've got some copies that are unnecessary left over we can remove those. Okay. Okay. So very briefly we're going to see this just intuitively and then we'll see some of the more more difficult problems in next lecture. Uh, so here we are we started with that graph the one that we had before. So let us. Uh, follow the principle rather rather than just doing what we could have done. In this case, we could just delete the finos. Next time, we'll see some some things where we can't do that, right? But what do we have to do? So if we look at this, we've got, uh, we've got to place copy operations on the incoming edges, okay? So as we discussed just a moment ago, we're going to put these copy operations here, all right? There's the copy operation here, which represents coming this part of the phi node. Copy operation there, which represents this part of the phi node. And you notice we've got a phi node here, which means that we're going to have to have uh, a copy operation here, which we've got just up there, right? That represents coming out there. And here, we can actually insert the A3 equals A4 there, but just for the sake of argument, I'm going to assume that this makes life difficult. And we're going to split this edge here. Okay, we'll see later in the next lecture some real examples of this. Um, so there we go. This is what node splitting, what edge splitting is about, where we take one of these edges where it's supposedly difficult, and we add in the copy operation there if we can't add it in there. Okay, this seems a bit confusing at the moment because I've made up this example. Next time we'll see some real examples where that that is absolutely necessary. All right, then we remove the phi nodes, and we are done. Okay. There are lots of extensions to SSA form. Uh, so the data flow assumes that all parts on CFG are taken, so we get these conservative operations. You get our guarded SSA form, which adds additional nodes, not just phi nodes, but phi, eta, and mu nodes, which uh, Pelos, being Greek, will be very happy about. <laughs> uh, it, do, do, are you proud of the fact that uh, people use uh, Greek letters, which confuse small you children mean, in school? And um, You mean gamma, eta, and uh, mu? Is, is it called me? It's not called mu. Me. No, it's gamma, eta, and mu. 
No. Oh, you Greeks don't know anything. <laughs> I told you before, ancient Greek okay, was pronounced with a British public school accent. In Germany, you pronounce it moo. Do you moo, really? Yeah. Ah. Very loud. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. Well, so we've agreed that Pavlis is wrong. Yeah. We're absolutely. just not sure absolutely. which of us is right. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Probably me. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, right. You were always right something. So this, this allows uh, additional information so that you can be uh, more precise about uh, these things. Uh, yeah, I keep pressing the wrong thing. Uh, these, uh, we usually talk about an array in SSA. In normal SSA, uh, you just deal with the array as a single monolithic object. Um, but there is uh, S uh, array-based SSA, which does uh, more fine, detailed analysis of this stuff. Um, Interprocedural things can be challenging for us to say. Pointer analysis, the moment you've got pointers, we start, we stop generally knowing what things the pointers can refer to, and that means that we end up with trouble about stuff. So pointer analysis is something that's um, currently and probably always will be an area of research. Pointers as in C. Oh my God, there's more. I'm sorry about this. Uh, there's, there's, I think we've, I think we've a couple of things, right? So this is just a constant propagation. We are seeing here a lattice about this, which is now going to be very easy to look at due to SSA. The lattice is very simple. We start with the bottom, where we don't know what a variable is, whether it's constant or not. Uh, we haven't got there yet. Uh, and a, a top element, which means that it's not a constant. And then for integers, these are my different constants that I can have. The meet operator is now very simple. Uh, you're either top, if if you meet top with uh, something that, with anything, then you get that, you get itself out. Meet bottom with anything, you get bottom. Meet a constant with a constant with the same thing, you get that. If you meet a constant with something that's not a constant, we get bottom, right? Uh, if it's not the same. And the transfer functions uh, for these compute the value, of course, uh, if all inputs are constant, all right? Okay. Is All that, right. Is that the last one? Yes, we made it. Woohoo! Okay, so we've looked at Delphi termination. We've looked at uh, some more examples of Delphi analysis. We looked at dominance, and we looked at static single form assignment. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Woohoo! There we are. We are done. <laughs>